And now, with sound investing, here's Paul Merriman. I have uh, only got 25 or so minutes, and so I want to talk about one of my favorite topics. First, I want to say thanks to Tom and Don. I think the educational work that they're doing is absolutely fantastic. It is, and it is what I believe in, is educate first and then and then maybe you manage or maybe you don't, but everybody wins. And so, uh, boy, he gets my uh, stamp of approval. Uh, number one reason I want small cap value in your portfolio. Uh, the, the foundation is focused really on helping people do better with their investments. It's for do-it-yourself investors, not for people who are looking to have somebody else do it. And the reason that we think our work is important is because we're producing all of the tools and information that you would need if you were an advisor. And if you are, in fact, a do-it-yourself investor, you are an advisor to the most important investor in the world. And so my view is you need to know what I needed to know when I was an advisor. And that's what we focus on. Now, we're talking millions, by the way. I just want to, I'm going to tell you, I hope you will read it. And then I want you to send a free PDF to all the people that you know you think it might help. It is really meant for first-time investors. But there are $12 million decisions in that book that if we can get them when they're in their 20s, it's a slam dunk. Our work really focuses on seven areas of investing. We are not financial planners, estate planners, tax people. We are only about investing. And we think those seven things have to do with equity asset class selection, how to put the equity asset classes together in a portfolio, how to add the fixed income to the, uh, to the portfolio, then you come to retirement, how do you take distributions, and at the end of the day, the one thing that a lot of do-it-yourself struggle with is knowing which ETF, which mutual fund to use. So we name names, at Vanguard, Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, Schwab, in an effort to do the best we can to help you be an effective uh, do-it-yourself investor. I'll be at Western next week. I'll be teaching two classes to about 200 students. And one of the first things I'll show them, and it's as important for retirees as it is, I think, for young people, and that is to understand the huge impact we can, we, we can uh, put on it to work for us in our portfolio if we just had a little bit more return. That little bit could be as much as one-tenth of one percent, but in this particular case, it's a half of one percent, and we have two scenarios here. One where somebody invests $6,000 a year, uh, $5,000 a year, over 46 years, and they earn 8% during the accumulation period, and then they retire, and they make 6% during the distribution period, and they take 4% distribution. Now, what would be the difference, whether you got 8 or 8.5 eight or 6 and 6.5? Six and Let me show you the difference. It's huge. By the way, the way you measure the return on your investments, it's not about a percentage return. The success of you as an investor really is a combination of you as a saver and you as an investor. Some people are amazing savers and terrible investors and still do well. Others don't save a lot, but they get lucky. But the bottom line is, at the end of the day, the real measure of your success is how much money you take out of your investments in retirement and how much you leave to others. You add those two things up, and that is the total outcome of your investing success. And what do I know? When I look at those same two scenarios, I notice here that the, 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 at age 67, the person that got 8% has 2.3 million. The person who got 8.5% has 2.6 million. The person at 97 dies that got the 6% then leaves 3.8 million. The person who gets the 6.5% gets 5.1 million. Together, the two things that happened is you spent money and you left money. The total for the first scenario, the eight and six, is 7.3 million. The total for the second scenario is 9.6 million. A $2.3 million difference just because of a half a percent on $230,000. 
And in, we're talking millions, there are over eight ways to add an extra half of 1%. And our kids and grandkids need to know it. Biggest decision we make is going to be what we do about equities because that's where the growth is. I don't care whether we're accumulating or we're in distribution. It's about equities and growth. It's the gas. Bonds are the brakes. So what equity asset classes we use makes a difference. And here's what we know going back to 1928. We know that the S&P 500 compounded at 11%. We know that large cap value compounded at 13.5. By the way, those are all of the 40-year periods that started in 1928. The average return of the S&P is 11 and 12, 13.5 for large cap value. What's the difference? The S&P 500 is mostly growth, but it has some value. Large cap value is supposed to be without the growth. And we know that large cap value, value is more risky and therefore historically has produced a better rate of return. Sounds a little backwards that what we consider to be the best would not have the best returns, but the fact is the safest thing we can do is put money in a CD and then what kind of returns do we get? But boy, it's great low risk, huh? Small cap blend then over that same period of time, starting in 1928, 13.7, and the gold ring of investment asset classes historically has been small cap value. And I am not here to turn everybody's portfolio or suggest that you should have all your money in small cap value. I'm going to suggest that for a year for a few before I leave, but even 10% can make a difference. And then on the far right-hand side, because what I think is exciting is how you combine these different asset classes. I don't want you to have all your money in the total market index. N neither do Tom and Don in the bunch. The fact is, is that the idea of having some small and some large and some value and some growth, it makes great sense. And so I look here at the four fund combo. 25% in each of those four asset classes produced a 13.7% compound rate of return on average looking at uh, some 55, 40-year periods. And this also shows you, uh, and you all got a PDF, I think, of this if you want it. Now, I don't want you to, you cannot see these, the small print here, I know. I want you to go up to, you are at 30,000 feet right now, folks. And so I don't expect you to, but I'm going to tell you what's here, because we can kind of, in a way, and I don't know if I can do this or not, can I use that? Mm, no. Uh, so here on the left-hand side, what we have is the small cap value asset class. One year at a time since uh, uh, 1970 through 2021. I want to thank Daryl Balls if he happens to be here in the room. I saw that he was signed up. Daryl, are you here? No, I don't think so. Daryl Ball has done more than 160 tables of this kind for people like you who are do-it-yourself investors. This is one of them. On the far left is the, is the S&P 500. On the far right is small cap value. One year at a time, you can compare them and see when they're better. As a matter of fact, Daryl even makes it easy to see who the winner is. He put a little green there. If small cap value beats S&P 500, it shows up. What do I know about the combination of those two asset classes? Well, let's see some numbers, I guess, hopefully, that you can actually see. I see the S&P 500 compounded at 11.1, .1, small cap value at 14. But if what I do to see the impact of adding small value is start with the S&P 500 and add 10%, I've added 10% to the S&P 500, so it's 90-10. That compound rate of return is 11.4. If I go one more step and have 20-80, it's 11.8. And then I look at those red numbers down below. Those are the worst periods you would have experienced, the worst year, the worst three months, the worst 36, 60, and the worst drawdown. Peak the valley and back up to that peak again is the drawdown when it's over. And by golly, the 2080 and the S&P 500 really look like they're almost exactly the same in terms of risk. What is different is the combination produced a 0.8% additional compound rate of return. Is that meaningful? Of course it is. And the longer we have to live, the more meaningful it is. Chris Pedersen is our director of research uh, both 
uh, Chris and Daryl work without pay. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Hundreds of hours each year. And there's somebody I know is here, I'll introduce in a second. But the work they do is amazing. Chris did a study looking back at the use of the, S &P, of the uh, small cap value and the S&P 500, 90, 10. He looked at five years, 10 years, 15, and 20. Over five years, the portfolio was better 71% of the time than the S&P 500. If you go out 10 years, it's better 83% of the time. 15 years, 94% of the time. I at 78 would be very lucky to get another 15 years. I like my odds right there by having some small cap value in my portfolio. But once you get out to 20 years, it's 100% of the 20 year periods. So when I'm talking to your kids and your grandkids, you can know, understand why I want them to have some of this in their portfolio. And here Here's what I like the best. Over all of those 40-year periods that he looked at, I think there were over 600 40-year periods, the average additional return, because you added 10% small cap value, was that magic one half of 1%. But we need to put that to work. None of these numbers mean a thing until we see what it means to our bottom line and to our estate, for example, when we pass on. So I'm going to decide here on using the 50-50 strategy in this fine-tuning table. The 50-50 strategy means 50% S&P 500, 50% small cap value. It's right in the middle. The compound rate of return was 12.7%. That's an additional 1.7% a year better than the S&P 500 on its own. And if you look at the worst outcomes, okay, instead of a 51% drawdown that the S&P 500 had, it was a 55, almost 56% drawdown. If you're going to lose a lot of money, that's not that much different, is it? And you'll notice, too, there, you can see, 24 of the years, the S&P 500 was the best. 28 of the years, the small cap value was the best. So it's oftentimes small cap value is outdone by the S&P 500. But it's the long term that matters, not the short term. Now I actually want to put it to work. What I want to do is I want to start, and we got, we got I think, 60 kinds of tables like this that have just to do with distributions. You want to take out 3, 4, 5, 6 percent. You want a portfolio, it's all S&P 500, 50, 50, whatever it might be. You'll have, hopefully have a table that would give you what you're looking for. Here's what I see about this, uh, uh, this particular table. We started with a million dollars in 1970. If you think that's too much to start with, start it with 100,000 and divide everything by 10. Then just for the sake of making this quick, I want to go right down to the bottom of the page. The middle column says 50-50. This is what my wife and I are. We are 50% bonds and 50% in stocks. That's how much risk we're willing to take, but not just the S&P 500. But if it had been the S&P 500, you would have taken distribution starting with 40000 a year in 1970, adjusting for inflation every year since 1970. And by the way, over that 52-year period, you would have taken out over $8 million. And if you had that 50-50 strategy and you did that, you would have had about $8 million left over to leave others. Not bad. But what if I take that same... 50-50 strategy, but instead of the 50-50 strategy being just the S&P 500 in the equity portion, what if I let it be the combination of the S&P 500 and small cap value? Well, let me show you up close. Well, not too close. But here's what I can see from where I'm standing. I can see that the 50-50 strategy for the S&P 500 ended up with not quite $8 million and $11 million if you were 100% in S&P 500 itself. Then I look down at the table below, which is the combination of the small cap and S&P 500, and the 50-50 ends up with, uh, oh my, got 30-some thousand dollars. Million. million, thank you. And the 100% stock is $141 million. 
Now, can you say, can we all say impossible? I mean, we're thinking that, aren't we? And yet all it is is the, the, the compounding of a bunch of numbers that happened in the past. The problem is there is no risk in the past. We always know what we should have done. But this is real to the extent that everything in the past is hypothetical because you can never replicate it. It's always hypothetical, whether it really happens or not. I want to talk to you for a second about the young'uns in your family. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning that is because I am here not thinking I'm going to change a lot of, of, of portfolios. Many of you are already working with Don and Tom, and many of you are do-it-yourselfers who have things in order, and they're just fine the way they are. But I'm also here in the hopes that you're going to share that book with your grandkids and your kids, and that they're going to read that, and they're going to read about the power of index funds and the power of low expenses and the power of more diversification and the power of a target date fund. And hopefully we're going to encourage them to in invest earlier and start with as little as they can, but get started, get the habit. That's the way it works. But I'm going to next week up at Western, I'm going to be showing them this page. This page is so powerful. Because what I'm recommending is a whole new way of young people thinking about investing. It's what I saw when I went into the investment community in the mid-60s. What they taught us was to buy 10 or 20 good companies, literally take the certificate. We got the certificate in those days. Go put it in a lockbox and do not open that lockbox until you're ready to retire and you want to start taking money out. It was true buy and hold. And what did they want us to buy? Sears, uh, IBM, AT&T. I mean, there were these these companies that were just the darlings uh, of the investment community, thinking these are, the, these are for the long term the right thing to own. And probably as a group, you would have done fine. I do know buy and holders my age who are still 100% in equities and 100% in individual securities. I'm not comfortable suggesting that to a young person, but I would be absolutely comfortable to have them think like like Warren Buffett, and, and with the idea that when you buy something, you're buying it forever, not just to, to, to flip it and make a short-term profit. So what I would suggest is we do everything we can in our power to get $6,000 a year from 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 into a Roth IRA. I talked to somebody today before I even suggested this who is doing this very thing. And just that first five years, that is all I'm asking. And then they just close that account down and they don't touch it until they're 65 or 70 or whenever they're going to retire. And for what it's worth, if you put that into small cap value in a Roth IRA, would it be, would it be possible that you would compound at 12% a year over that, over that long period? Absolutely. I mean, the average 40-year period looking backwards is about 16%. We don't know. We don't know. We never know. But I'm telling you, it's possible. I don't want you to know at the end of five years, they're going to be right on track if they have $42,000. And they're going to say, where is my million dollars? They can't figure out why they aren't further along. And that's because those years, it's their money going in. It's not how much you make. It's their money being put in there. They are doing their part. Later, the market will do their part. And by age 65, they would have $3.5 million by uh, between 1960, age 65 and age 95. They will have taken out $15 million in withdrawals. They will have left $22 million to their heirs for a total return on that $30,000 of $37, almost $38 million. And it's just the compounding effect. Yes, it would be less if you used the S&P 500 and got 10% but it wouldn't be terrible. There is a man in this room. I, I mentioned Chris and Daryl have given so much, hundreds and hundreds of, of, of volunteer hours to do the work that's on our website. And there's a young fellow who learned by chance, really a random event almost, and what he learned was how to use the information on our site to invest and start building his retirement. 
But it wasn't enough what we had there. No, no, he had to develop a calculator so he could take all the numbers we've got, all the pages, and he could put his numbers on in the calculator and see what he would be like worth given how much he was putting in and when he wanted to retire and all of those things. And then after he had done all of that and he was happy with it, he came to us and said, would you like to have it? And it is now the Merriman Lifetime Investment Calculator. It is absolutely, and Craig Apple, where are you, Craig? Come on. If anybody around, there he is way in the back. It, I mean, I've had some people write some, some, some checks to help us as an organization. But what he gave, uh, it wasn't about what he gave to us. I think it's what he gave to you, if you like to use a calculator. If you like our work, we've got it divided into a bunch of areas about equity and, 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 and asset classes, about, about how, to, how to combine them, the fine-tuning tables, all these things that will lead you to the tables that we have. You just go through these links, and that's how you get there to get all that work. Uh, and then, not only is there the We're Talking Millions, uh, but there's also the Two Funds for Life. Chris Pedersen, again, at no cost to our foundation, writes the book, and it is on Amazon. It is, it is a wonderful, wonderful book, almost all five-star ratings. As a matter of fact, by the way, I'm going to brag here for a second. We're Talking Millions has had 99 written reviews. I wish we had more. I'd love it if some of you decided to do that after you read the book. And, and for 96 of them are five-star and three of them are four star. So we are getting to people, we're just not getting the book to enough people. So I am available personally not to help you invest. I am available to answer questions of general questions about investing. My days of helping people one by one are over. My job now is to hopefully help millions and anything you can do to help me get there by telling people about us uh, you, you, you are a friend of the organization. Now you get to hear from a brilliant man. By the way, did I over... Oh, I've still got more time to talk. <laughs> I, you know something? It really is my nap time. <laughs> and you know how when you get tired, your, your grandkids get mouthy? I, I overdid it. Well, let me just take a second then and, and, and talk about what I think are the most important investment decisions uh, that we're ever going to make. But I'm going to try to think of it uh, as a retiree, what are the most important decisions that we make. One of them, I think, is decide to decide what part of our portfolio is for us and what part of our portfolio is for others. I have some, my wife and I have some investments uh, in a very aggressive strategy. I and mean, it's not foolishly aggressive, but it is all equities. But that money is not for us. That's for those who survive us. My IRA is all invested to go into the foundation that, that, that uh, we founded because I want, after I'm gone, for the foundation to continue. That's a different asset allocation. And so I, I think oftentimes what people do is they build a portfolio that is kind of a, the, the, the strategy for the whole portfolio. And, and I think more good work is done with your investments if you can decide which part is for which, which one of your, of your goals. Of course, we all have to face this decision, almost all of us who have been around a long time. We have to face this decision. What do we do about these great big capital gains we're going to have uh, if, we take, if we sell the things that now have big profits? But really, we should be passing the baton of risk to somebody else. I know when I sold uh, the, the Merriman Wealth Management Company, my total investment is that company was $15,000. And so at the end of 30 years, it gets sold. I didn't blink for one second to have to pay the, the, the capital gains tax on the sale of that company because it was time to let somebody else take that risk. And, uh, and, and, and I think, I really truly think it was the right thing to do. Would I have made more money if I had just stayed invested and let other people take it over and run it? Yes. 
But that doesn't make it right. And that's one of the interesting parts. When you have an advisor, and I think this is what is so very, very tough, is that when you are your own advisor, it is hard to have uh, a, a, an objective, unbiased conversation. And that's where I think of, of somebody in between you and your own thoughts uh, is very, very important. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.